Hi, I'm Jason Mears, and this is an introductory course to Amazon Web Services. This is AWS Basics. Um, I created this course because when I was learning how to use Amazon Web Services, I found lots of courses that had a great amount of detail about lots and lots of topics, but I couldn't find anything that gave me a general grounding first to help me understand what the more detailed courses were on about. So this is my attempt at doing a, an AWS Basics course for the benefit of other people who want to do more advanced topics. So AWS um, is divided up into regions. So uh, Amazon Web Services see the world in regions and you'll see there for every uh, blue dot, there is a region where Amazon have data centers. And then each region is subdivided again further into things called availability zones. So just as an example, uh, there's a region there called London, which was launched in 2016. And inside the London region, there are three availability zones, which are effectively um, mini data centers of their own. Now, when I say mini, uh, I don't mean that they're, they're tiny or that they're small. It's just that a region has more than one availability zone. So if at any point you ever want to have a look at what regions and zones and edges there are, you can always go to the AWS website and have a look and it'll tell you what's currently there in which region you can select from the top um, from different categories there up at the top. So what is an availability zone or what's inside an availability zone? Well, an availability zone is basically a, a data center with lots and lots of uh, servers or computers all racked uh, in aisles. And there you'll see on the photograph there, you can see all the racks, you can see all the servers inside and a trolley that you'll occasionally see people wheeling around so they can connect a keyboard and mouse and a screen to any of those servers. But essentially an availability zone is a big hole full of racks, full of computers. So how does this relate to learning uh, AWS? So those regions we talked about, I'm just going to show a region as that big blue square there. So I've got a region, for example, it could be London, it could be Ireland, it could be any of those shown on the map. And I'm going to show another region, and another region. So just on this diagram, I'm showing three different regions. Now remember we talked about inside each region, you typically have three or more availability zones. So I'm going to put an availability zone in that first region. That's one of those data centers. And then I'm going to carry on and I'm going to put three in there. So this might be an example of what we got in London. We've got one region with three availability zones or three data centers in that region. Um, so if I now move on, I'm going to put the same three availability zones in the other regions. But you've got an idea now of how, of how regions contain usually three or more availability zones. And those availability zones are you know, those things that we saw that look like a data center. So I've just made it a little bit smaller on this picture, but again, the region, the region still has three availability zones. And the reason I've done that is that I want to create something inside it. Now you'll hear the word, uh, people say, I'm going to create a construct. It, it's just a technical term for a uh, an idea or a conceptual thing inside the data center. So regions and availability zones are, are real and a VPN, uh, sorry, a VPC or a virtual private cloud is a construct or a border or a logical grouping um, of um, network resources or data center resources. So this is almost like a network boundary around availability zones inside of a region. So you can think of the VPC as being your big data center that contains all of the little AZs inside or the little um, server holes inside. Again, I should probably stop saying little because uh, certainly Amazon Web Services data centers are not little. Um, they are compared to you know a region though. So you'd create a VPC inside a region and that would contain one or more availability zones. And again, we can do that for the other regions. So it might, it's not uncommon for an organization to be using multiple regions and multiple availability zones in each region and to group them by VPC or virtual private cloud, which again is just a, a boundary for doing networking inside AWS. So we're going to move on from that and I'm going to just show you one now. I'm going to simplify this a lot and I'm only going to show one region and I'm only going to show one availability zone. And the only reason for doing that is just that I don't have enough room on screen to show you anything any bigger than that. So here's my region for argument's sake, could be London. 
and here's one of the availability zones inside that region. So again, availability zone is that data center, the, the picture of all the uh, computers in racks in that hall. So I'm gonna create a VPC in that region that includes that availability zone. So again, this is a network boundary or a logical way of grouping networks just so that we can manage it. And what you'll probably find is that once you've created a VPC, you tend to forget about the availability zone and the region behind it. Once you've made sure your VPs, VPCs are organized sensibly, you tend to think in just VPCs then and not specifically the regions or the zones underneath. You just make sure that you set it up correctly first. And then most people would focus on the VPC as being the, the starting point. So there's my VPC in an availability zone. And the first thing I'm going to do with that VPC is I'm going to create two subnets. The first one is a private subnet. So this doesn't have any access to the outside world whatsoever. And inside that subnet, I'm going to create something called an EC2 instance. So you can either think of this as a server or a virtual machine or what Amazon call an EC2 instance. And if I just explain the EC2, what EC2 means is uh, letter E and then the letter C twice. So it's scientific notation. So that really means ECC or Elastic Compute Cloud, but shortened or abbreviated to just EC2. So that's the equivalent of a server, a VM, or what an AWS administrator would call an EC2 instance. And if you can learn the term instance, that will definitely help you going forward. So the next subnet I'm going to build is going to be a public subnet. So this is not only going to have uh, private connections, it's also going to have public connections. It's going to be able to communicate with things outside or communicate with things on the internet or uh, outside the AWS data center. And again, I'm going to create an EC2 instance. So Elastic Compute Cloud instance. Again, just think of it as being a server or a virtual machine. However, you like to think about that lump of compute, that uh, computing power and memory. So we've got one region. And in that region, we've got a VPC that includes one availability zone. And then inside that VPC, I've got a private subnet and a public subnet. And then in each of those subnets, I've got one EC2 instance or server or virtual machine, whichever way you prefer to think of it. So we've now got two subnets and two machines. We've actually got something usable at this point, but we've not actually connected it to anything yet. So let's add the internet outside that data center. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an internet gateway. Now this internet gateway is going to belong to that VPC and those subnets. And what we're going to be able to do with that gateway is have bi-directional communication. So traffic can go in and out of that internet gateway. Now, what I mean by that is, is that that EC2 instance in the public subnet, this one here, can get out on the internet, but also the internet can come back into it. So if this was a web server, you might want connections from the internet to come into that EC2 instance. So it's bi-directional. Now that's not going to be what everybody wants. Some people might find that they just want the the EC2 instance or the server in that pubnet uh, that public subnet to be able to go and connect to the internet, but they don't want the internet to be able to connect to it. So that's a, a one-way uh, um, connection, and we call that a NAT gateway. So this is basically doing NAT to allow it to connect to the internet for things like patches and updates, but it's not allowing the internet to connect directly back into it. So we've got a NAT gateway and an internet gateway, and we can either connect um, an instance to an internet gateway to make it bi-directional, or we can connect it to a NAT gateway um, to make it um, a single direction, just an outward connection. Um, and they'll both actually end up going through the internet gateway, but it just depends which one we connect it to first. So we've got a bi-directional internet connection and a single direction internet connection. So that's how we get a put, um, an EC2 instance that's meant to talk to the internet out to the internet. Um, the next thing we need to look at is how we're actually going to get connections into the VPC from the outside world. So the simplest and easiest way of doing this once you're starting is a VPN gateway or a virtual private gateway. So we connect a VPN gateway uh, to the VPC and those subnets. 
And then at the customer site, we have what we call a customer gateway. Now this is most likely a firewall device or a VPN concentrator, but it's the other end of the VPN. And then what we're able to do with this is set up uh, one or two tunnels because you're allowed to do this in HA is a tunnel from the customer gateway into the VPN gateway. And then the customer site can now do site to site VPN into the VPC and the subnets inside it. So that's how people get started. And that's the simplest and easiest way to do a customer site, having a, a site to site VPN into the VPC or virtual private cloud. What most people do when they start to use this a little bit more is with they set up another virtual private gateway and they'll connect that through something called a direct connect. So this is a dedicated connection. This is usually higher bandwidth. It's usually higher reliability and it's also private. So if you look here, you can see that this VPN connection is traveling over the internet from the customer site into the VPC, whereas this direct connect is going directly from the customer site into the virtual private gateway. Now it may go through a partner, but, but what we can say is it's certainly not going over the open internet. So if we just have a look at what we've got here, we just step back a bit. We've got um, a region um, and what we've done is create a VPC in that region. Uh, we're just using a single availability zone in this example, but you could use more. And we've created a private subnet which has an EC2 instance in it. So this is private, it's not talking to the outside world. We now have a public subnet with an EC2 instance, and this cannot talk out to the world through a NAT gateway in one direction, or it can allow connections in and out through an internet gateway. And this is how we're getting out to the internet. So that's how these machines are getting out. And then if we want to get a connection from the customer site into the VPC, we can use a VPN gateway using a customer gateway and a VPN gateway which can have two connections for high availability. And we've got the other option, which is the more kind of robust. So this is the direct connect, and this is going directly into the virtual private gateway. This is not going over the internet. So this is a private connection. It may go through a partner, but it's certainly not going over the open internet. So that's the other way of doing connections from the customer site um, into the VPC. So the next thing on from that, would be consuming services. So maybe these machines in this in this public subnet here, maybe this machine here wants to talk to something like DynamoDB, or it wants to do something like connect to an NS3 bucket. Now by default, the only way to do this because these are public services was to actually go out over the internet to come back round to a public service. But obviously these are AWS services, and this is an AWS service, it doesn't always make sense to go out to the internet to come back in again. So instead of doing this, going out through a gateway and going all the way around and back, going over an, um, what might be a slower connection, but certainly it's a public connection, there is another way or a better way of doing this. And that better way of doing this is called um, an endpoint. So there's lots of different kinds of endpoints, and you'll see from the arrows here that they're bi-directional. You can talk backwards and forwards through these endpoints. Traffic can flow in both directions. Um, lots of different types of endpoint. We're not gonna cover them in this video because it would take too long, but we can basically have endpoints, um, something like a private link, uh, endpoint, a VPC endpoint, an interface endpoint, or a gateway endpoint. So again, not gonna cover them in this video, but just know that they are there and available. And these endpoints are a way of EC2 instances being able to communicate with AWS services internally instead of having to go externally via the internet. So again, endpoints are for connecting EC2 instances to internal services on the private network rather than the public network over the internet. So that's where we are. Um, the thing I should add next is that it's quite common to have multiple VPCs. So if I had another VPC, I'd have to duplicate these connections here. This customer gateway would have to have another two connections to a new VPC, maybe over here. And then this direct connect would have to have another virtual private gateway on the new, VP, uh, on the new VPC and over here. So you start to end up having lots and lots of connections because every uh, VPN gateway and every direct connect gateway needs to be done um, for every single VPC you've got. If you start getting into tens or hundreds of VPCs, this just becomes 
um, hundreds, uh, possibly even thousands of, of mesh connections across the board. So AWS looked at this and decided that there would be a better way of doing this. Um, so there is a, a direct connect gateway, but I'm going to skip over that and I'm going to move to something else called a transit gateway. So a transit gateway is specifically designed to be a central way of connecting um, inbound connections, like a direct connect or a VPN, to multiple VPCs. So in this example, our VPN connection and our direct connect could come straight into the transit gateway. So it's a single um, instance or single attachment to the transit gateway. And then the transit gateway can drop um, connections into that VPC there, but it can also do it to additional VPCs. So the idea of a transit gateway is it consolidates inbound connections and those being able to route to or get to multiple VPCs. So I'm going to pause it there. We've covered quite a lot just for an introductory session, but I hope that you found that useful and I hope that's made it look a little bit more um, understandable so that when you move on to a more advanced course, you have a bit better idea about how all this works. So thank you very much for your time and I hope you did find that useful.